My prayer, my hope for my children is that even despite all of these things that are happening, um, that they will not lose their faith, um, that they will stay strong in their faith. I'm going to tell you a story, a story that's going on for you, most particularly right now. I'm going to tell you a story about betrayal, infidelity, and grave hardship. I'm going to tell you a story about successors of the apostles who are not living up to the mission. I'm going to tell you a story that involves great corruption, great evil, but also great hope. I'm going to tell you the story of Sanctus Ranch. You've all heard about cancellations now of priests, especially, and even in this diocese. You've heard about cancellation of good deacons. You've heard about cancellation of Latin masses. You've heard about cancellations of good orders. You've heard about cancellations of good bishops. God bless Bishop Strickland. But this is unique because this is the attempted cancellation of a holy Catholic family and their own private business. Since when, in all the time that the liberal bishops have championed the rights of workers, the rights of people to have what they need to survive, have you ever heard of the cancellation of a family, let alone a family with six children? But yet, that's what you're living today. So, stay tuned to this episode of the John Henry Weston Show. <laughs> and let's begin, as we always do, with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, I'm going to read to you the, um, the article, which is going to appear on LifeSite News in a few days touching this very topic. In a devastating blow to a faithful Texas Catholic family with six children who've made their living running a private ranch, the Archbishop of San Antonio, Texas, has issued a letter to all Catholics directing them not to do business with the ranch. The January 30th letter prohibits all clergy, schools, retreat centers, Catholic groups, quote, from contracting or with or utilizing Sanctus Ranch for any Catholic-sponsored retreats, meetings, activities, or spiritual endeavors, end quote. Even where contracts were already signed, the bishop directed them to discuss it with his legal team rather than fulfill their contractual obligations. Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Siller instructs Catholics generally against Sanctus Ranch, telling them, quote, not to, and I quote, to participate in any of its activities, end quote. So, you might ask yourself, what could motivate such an absolutely serious sanction, something that is so drastic you've never heard of it before? Could it be, for instance, that, you know, there is some, uh, are they promoting abortion? Are they promoting homosexuality, same-sex marriage? Are they offering contraception to guests? Are they, you know, advocating women priests, or are they offering scandalous sex education in the school here? Is there come some kind of sex scandal involved? Were they instructing people against the teachings of the church? Obviously, the answer to that is no. A resounding no on all fronts. In fact, it's just the opposite. You know, what's interesting, though, in this very diocese, there are Catholic priests and Catholic teachers guilty of every single one of those charges, and none of them have been issued a censure, let alone been canceled. What's wrong in the archdiocese?
Dan Savigny is the founder and owner of Sanctus Ranch, and he and his family, his wife Jennifer, and their six children uh, run this ranch uh, for the glory of God. Dan, thank you for being with us. Well, thank you for coming down. It's, uh, it's an amazing place. We've been here just, uh, just over the day and looking around. Let's start with this chapel. I mean, this is incredible. Um, beautiful artwork you've got here. The, the marble work is incredible. Um, you know, how long did it, you, you constructed this uh, yourself or had it constructed? Yeah. We did, yes. This, uh, this building was actually built, and we thought it was going to be a meeting space. Uh, and then as the Lord kept putting on our heart different retreats and other things that were going on, we needed a bigger place for worship. And so uh, earlier this year, back in about August, uh, we went ahead and started to construct the sanctuary here, and Regina Chapel came to life. Wait, August is uh, that this? Wait a minute. Like less than half a year ago that's right about six months ago and we just uh, we knew that that was the time and so the lord spoke to me and the next day we started construction so did you have a big crew here because i mean obviously you can't lay all this and do all this in such little time so what would you have for a crew actually it was great it was myself and my two older boys and uh, we got started and did all of the construction on the base levels uh, built out the altar rail built out all the backdrops the altar uh, and then i had a crew come in that i assisted and we did the tile together wow about eight weeks <laughs> well let's let's look at a clip of that uh because that's just unreal so, okay, tell us about what is Sanctus Ranch? How did you dream this up? Where did this come from? I had been involved in a lot of youth ministry, other ministries. My wife uh, had also been involved. We had six children. And, you know, so as we would go out and go to different retreat centers, we were always struck that they were a little bit underwhelming kind of subpar. My wife is an Italian. She's a great cook and the food was never that great. And so, you know, we had early on in our marriage started to feel this call that the Lord might be asking us to build a retreat center. Uh, originally, we were not in Texas uh, when we started to have that first little nudge. Uh, but then as we got to Texas, it, it, it resurfaced. And we knew that back in 2016, it was time. Um, we weren't sure how uh, exactly, but we began to just take a look for property that might be available that we could build a retreat center and build a place where people could kind of retreat from the world, come out and encounter our Lord at a greater level. And so that's how it started. So this was started out of a, a faith conviction, but yet you had to earn for your family to make do. You've involved all your kids in this work, your wife in this work. It's a struggle, a, a labor of love. You're, you're making ends meet, hopefully, but you, it, it looks like something you've poured into rather than got lots out of. Yeah, so, well, you know, when we first started, we were going to have both our religious retreats, and then I also had a company at the time I was doing some consulting. Uh, we were able to do that for a period of time, but then we hit the great pandemic, <laughs> and that shut everything down in the retreat world, and uh, as we didn't have any staff, uh, we, we had to kind of consolidate. Uh, so really, for the last... Two or three years we've been rebuilding. Uh, we had built out tons of facilities. We have 110 beds uh, here at Sanctus Ranch. And so it's a lot of work. And so uh, there are many hours that it's my wife Jennifer and I and the kids, they're being voluntold uh, to get everything done so that we can kind of keep this place operational. Beautiful. And now over these past uh, year or more, things have been going fairly well with regard to getting people in for retreats and, and things like that happening. Yeah, it's been going well. Interesting, I will say, um, since the world shut down and, uh, and our church decided to shut down, ever since then, retreats have come back in. We've been very busy. Every weekend we'll have a retreat, but the numbers have been smaller. And so even that, with the numbers being smaller, has been an adjustment. Uh, but, you know, it was really starting to pick back up. And we thought 2024, you know, we might have just weathered the storm enough. Uh, and, and the Lord was going to start to bring some new things. Well, indeed, he sought to bring a new thing. Um, not something that uh, you were expecting. So that was the first thing that struck me. The, the Archbishop, Archbishop. Gustavo Garcia Silla releases this letter 
that's unreal. Now, providentially, I knew you because you and your son Matthew came down to Rome Life Forum in Rome, and um, I got to know you there. And all I knew, and I'll, I'll say you don't have to close your ears, but you're just a holy, faithful Catholic who wants to do what God wants, and you've got a beautiful son who looks like he's going, leaning toward priesthood at the very least, and that's awesome. And I have a holy jealousy because I, you know, I've got six sons. I hope one of them might be where your Matthew is in discerning priesthood like that. Um, but to see that letter from the Archbishop, that was, the only term that comes to mind is vicious. Because it's attacking your livelihood in addition with false accusations. But tell us about the impact of uh, that letter. As I understand, it was sent from the Archbishop to every parish in the diocese, group that calls itself Catholic in the diocese, to all the religious houses in the diocese, it, is, it says it prohibits them, which is a formal command, and then to the faithful, the rest of the diocese, just all Catholics, he says, yeah, don't go to anything, any of their activities. So like if you guys hold a, a fishing tournament with a, with a fish fry after, they can't come to that either. Right. That doesn't, it's not, forget about it. No, well, we shouldn't forget about it. But let's say it's beyond immoral. I don't know, is that even legal? Well, there are questions. And, you know, we, since that letter came out January 30th, uh, when I was made aware of it early in the morning, my text uh, messages kind of blew up and I read it. I was shocked. Um, I'm very much confused by it. Uh, I don't know why this is the approach that was taken. Um, but, you know, we are exploring and continue to pursue uh, canonical and civil a action uh, because it is just uh, what, what we would state is just an egregious overstep. Uh, it's an abuse that, uh, that is quite shocking, quite frankly. So this diocese, Archbishop, Garcia Siller is controversial for not canceling things that should be canceled and for canceling a lot of things that uh, shouldn't be canceled. So that's what made me wonder, you know, because you have basically congregants coming here, it's unofficial, but and it's not, you know, public in that sense that the bishop has control over it. Um, the bishop's letter, in fact, questions the validity of the Mass, which I thought, that's pretty scary because that would make the public think, oh my gosh, it's not a real Mass. Whereas you can't, he can't do that. The Father Closter is validly ordained. Uh, he is uh, not restricted from saying Mass. He's saying this is considered a private Mass, even though people can uh, come to it. It's not public uh, in that it's not even in a church. This is a private chapel that you built. Um, that's unreal to me. What's your... It was really one of the more shocking parts of the letter. You know, I, I, I'm not uh, a canon lawyer, uh, but as soon as I started to read it, uh, it, it was confusing. And I think that it's unfortunate when we have decrees or information that comes out from the church in that way because it allowed people to question what they might have experienced um, as a priest that is here and saying a mass if someone goes to mass and that is a validly ordained priest it is a valid mass as long as you have proper form uh, and you know in the letter it even said that confessions that were heard here were invalid uh, because the faculties weren't there. Uh, and, and John Henry, I think the biggest challenge is all of that was stated in a letter publicly and never stated to me prior. Um, there was an opportunity that we were looking to sit down with the archdiocese, uh, and th then this letter trumped all of that. Uh, so I think it does shock people. It sho shocks the, the family members that are here at the school, wondering, well, wait a second, did something go wrong? Uh, and I just think that that's really uh, poor. It's, it's uncharitable. Uh, and, uh, and really, I hope that there's some resolution that that can be addressed uh, in short order. So this letter, it seemed to drop all of a sudden, but in it, it says they've been trying to contact you for months. And I mean, it's stark. It's, it's not only a little bit stark. Let me, let me just read, uh, if you don't mind holding that for a second. 
Let me just read one section of it that I just found is, is so strong. It is unbelievable. It's the kind of condemnation you, you would think would come from a, a pro, having a pro-abortion priest or a pro-homosexual gathering in a Catholic church or something, but no. It's about Sanctus Ranch is not, and the not's in all caps, not and never has been a, an approved Catholic apostolate. Have you ever claimed to be an approved Catholic apostolate? No, that's the shocking thing. We haven't claimed that, and that's one of those great misrepresentations. But, but it goes on. It is a privately owned business that is misrepresenting itself to the public. I cannot and will not be silent and witness the people of God being misled by those who are acting independently of the Catholic Church in the Archdiocese of San Antonio. I'm sorry. It's so strong. And it, it's dropped. They say they've been trying to contact you for months. What happened there? Well, well uh, we have had an invitation to go meet uh, with the archdiocese. And via email, we went back and forth. Uh, the holidays were there, so we got it scheduled. Uh, and that meeting was scheduled for the last week in January. Uh, and uh, I sent an email back to the archdiocese stating that uh, there were some things I had additional questions about and that previous weekend, we had a big freeze here in South Texas, and I actually lost the well here, um, broke pipes. I was standing in six, eight inches of water, and I had to replumb the entire thing. And yes, I do that myself. Uh, so I sent an email saying that I would, I was asking to reschedule that appointment, uh, and then within a day, I received a letter from the in-house counsel telling me that I'm no longer to speak to anyone and to refer everything to him as the lawyer and so that pretty much shut down communications wow so a family guy running a family business does most of the stuff himself has the freak accident because in texas i don't think things freeze very often um and have to deal with the frozen pipe so i have to postpone the meeting and that's it that was it and it's really sad um uh, it starts to uh give one the thought that maybe we're not acting in goodwill. And uh, it's disappointing. You know, in some ways, it, you can understand that perhaps in public parlance, secular parlance, that's just blowing you off when you say my pipes froze, like someone ate my homework, and it's a lie. One thing that Catholics don't do is lie. And so, here you are in good faith, and obviously they either didn't trust you or, or whatever, but it's just unreal. No, it is, and it's sad. And, you know, it's not like I'm 10 minutes from the Chancery office. Uh, it was a scheduled appointment, and I just had 100 people coming in for a weekend retreat. I had to put water back on. And so that was the, uh, that was the priority. Um, but then it went from a casual meeting, everybody's okay, we're scheduling it, to an attorney's letter, and within six days, I believe, six days, a total public defamation of everything we're doing. Let's talk about the school, because the school is mentioned in the letter that, uh, you know, it's not an official uh, school. I can't remember the exact wording of uh, what the uh, Archbishop says in the letter, but he basically attacks the school, uh, Lumen Christi Academy, I believe it's called. And... Uh, what is that? What's your response to his charges? Yeah, Lumen Christi Academy came about for our family, uh, along with a couple of other families, because we experienced a Catholic school that just had a massive tuition increase. And that was towards the end of last year. And uh, we just were not in that position. You know, we, we run a retreat center. This, this isn't uh, something that we could pay those kinds of tuitions. So we started to have this conversation. What should we do? Should we homeschool? Should we do a co-op? And as these conversations move forward, we really landed on a private micro school. And so we decided to open a private micro school as a group of Catholic laity. Uh, and so we wanted a micro school from sixth grade to 12th grade where the kids could come and learn in a, in a culture that was or an ethos of a school, if you would, that was totally Catholic. Um, but it is not an archdiocesan school. It's never been advertised as an archdiocesan school. It is a classical education in a private micro school. And it was a great way to have something being done here Monday through Thursday where we don't typically have retreats in. Yeah. One, of the, one of the accusations in the letter, too, is that you're illicitly using the name Catholic. <laughs> 
That was one of the more uh, humorous and challenging to read because, uh, you know, if it, one was to go to my website, they would see the use of the word Catholic is how I reference myself. Um, Sanctus Ranch is not a Catholic retreat center per se, but my wife and I are Catholic. Our family is Catholic. And when you come on this property, we have brought that Catholic tradition into everything, be it the Sacred Heart statues, the statue of St. Michael the Archangel. We've got Our Lady in many different places. Um, and so it's interesting. The attack came as I used the word Catholic without authorization. Uh, and yet I will tell you, we've spent the last eight years running a facility being attacked from the other side with people that want to come and use the facility asking, would you mind taking down the pictures of the saints? And I said, no, because I'm Catholic and that's how we're gonna run this place. You're welcome to utilize it or not. But we've never put it out that the school or the retreat center is a Catholic archdiocesan facility. It's unbelievable. I, this is happening all over the place and not just here actually, that there are uh, not so elaborate as yours, I must say, but that there are ranches and, and homes being used as sort of sanctuaries for the Latin Mass, which is being canceled just about everywhere. So I see this, and, and, and in my interview with Bishop Schneider, who was very much about this, he said, you know, this home churches, if you will, which is, which is what this is in a way, will become the underground church in America, in, in different countries all over the world. And it's happening. And I think this is an example of the backlash, the officialdom backlash against the underground church because the underground church is forming because what is coming, God forbid, and, and it's happening, unfortunately, and God knows, but he has a plan for it. But there is a false church being built, one that is accepting of homosexuality, uh, one that is accepting of a woman's right to choose, as, as it might be called. One that is going to be promoting a w women in ordained roles in the church. One that is, uh, you know, forbidding of uh, Holy Communion on the tongue. Uh, it, all this stuff sounds familiar and, and because it's already happening. There, is, there are these little oasis places that have to be off the official map because they're, you know, it's being squelched. And so this very much sounds to me like a story about the underground church being established, but at the same time facing the kind of shutdown we'd expect. Well, and I think you and I share this as fathers. We have a responsibility. As laymen, we have a responsibility. We're the spiritual leaders of our domestic church. And so when you and I see what's going on in the church, it, it, it's a moment of arrest to like, wait, no, that's not where we're going to go. That can't be what I'm teaching my children. That is not the faith, the Catholic faith that we have known for thousands of years. And so we must do something. That might mean for some people, they're driving two and three hours to attend a mass that is reverent, that is bringing the faith to their family and enriching that spirit. Um, but for others of us, it might say, hey, right here in my home, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that my family has access to the faith. And that's what my wife Jennifer and I have done here with our business, Sanctus Ranch. We've said we're going to be who we are and we're going to make a place. Uh, it can be retreats that are coming out. It may be that people are utilizing Sanctus Ranch and Lumen Christi Academy as a school. And it might be a place where people just come in community because the attack is here. It's at our doorstep. Uh, we wish it was the world. We wish it wasn't even our own church at times, but the road of a Christian often leads to the cross. And so I think we all better get ready. Indeed, indeed. Now, you are uh, open to taking this fight to the proper authorities, in other words, to a canonical court or to uh, civil, uh, civil courts if needed. Um, what's, what's preventing you from doing that right now, and what, what are your needs? Well, one of the things that is really a challenge is when you run a facility like this, you're dependent on the next weekend and the next weekend. Uh, what the Archbishop's letter did is it m immediately cut off all the retreats. Um, they ha I have retreats where uh, parishes have contracts with us and they just sent me a letter stating that they're going to break the contract and they don't care. Um, 
quite frankly, it's most of the retreat weekends we had were Catholic churches that were here and they've all come off the table. Uh, so our biggest challenge uh, moving forward is to, uh, number one, not be rash. I think that when people react rashly, sometimes it's not as prudent as it could be. So to be patient, to, uh, to pray and ask the Lord for what his will is. Uh, and then we have to put together a plan uh, because basically we just had the complete elimination of all revenue. Um, and that comes after fighting for the last two and three years just to get back as we held on after the affliction. Wow. Your six children, uh, what are their ages? So my oldest is 23, all the way down to 13. And uh, so this, these, these are not games. This letter from the Archbishop, you know, when priests are canceled, you're talking about one individual who, God willing, will find some support. They can even sue for support. But this, this is unique in that the Archbishop of his own accord has attacked a Catholic family. A Catholic family trying to live for the faith, he's attacked it with very apparent falsehoods um, in a way that in, in some places, lawyers would be rubbing their hands together because they'll be able to go after the archdiocese. I wanted to tell you that, you know, all of you, that there is a life funder set up uh, for the Savinia family. Um, and if you go to uh, the link in this story, you'll find that life funder so that you can support the family in uh, their current needs and also the uh, challenge that they might put uh, to what's gone on here. We appreciate that. We're very grateful. Uh, as you say, you know, we're a family. This is uh, this is, has a big effect on us. Um, many people don't know. Uh, we have we have folks that come to Sanctus Ranch and have for years, and they go, "Wow, it is so beautiful. It's so wonderful." What they might not know is I took absolutely everything that I have, everything, and it's in these buildings and it's in the operation. Uh, my wife works. 60, 70, 80 hours a week, sometimes even more, to provide all the meals and everything. Um, we've been all in. We've been all in for a long, long time. My children don't have the college education fund. My kids uh, don't have things set aside. We don't have the retirement account. We don't have any of that. Um, and so to take this blow now, at that point, as a father, is difficult. Um, but we'll continue to do whatever we have to. Uh, we pray that the Lord will send support if that's his desire uh, for us to continue. We will continue to operate a facility, bring in retreats so that people can encounter our Lord. Uh, but it's going to take some help. We need some help. And, uh, and if there's someone that's listening and they're in that position to help with advice, prayers, we'll take that. Uh, monetarily, uh, it's going to be a little bit of a work. This is, uh, this is David versus Goliath, um, but we're pretty good with a slingshot. Beautiful. Dan, can you so, show us around the property a little bit? I would love to show you guys. So here we are. We're kind of approaching the retreat center. So maybe we'll take our walk up here, and I'll show you all the different facilities from our cafeteria to our meeting spaces, and then we'll go check out the lodging in the chapel too. That sounds awesome. Your, your stonework is incredibly beautiful. Very, very blessed. Some of this was here before my wife and I purchased the property, and then we've continued that same theme in all the buildings that we've gone ahead and built. Amazing. Let's go. All right. <laughs> so this building was original, right? This, this was... building was original, yeah. and then that building over there was a steel frame garage ah. and it actually had tractors in it <laughs> when we bought it. Oh my. So this is actually now the, the residence yeah. um, it rambles on, but that one was a uh, five bathroom, two bedroom house. Wow. And we had six children, so that <laughs> didn't work out so well. So we took the three car garage and put in three more bedrooms in there. <laughs> so, wow but never intended it to be where we would live, but uh, it, was, uh, it was a better financial decision to stay in the house versus building something else yeah. um, with what we could rent it for as a retreat. Yeah. 
So this is Magna Hall. This is one of our primary meeting spaces. Actually, we're going to use it for a big meeting tonight, so we'll probably get to see that a little bit more as we move forward. But typically when retreats come in, this is the space that they're going to use uh, for lots of different things. How many can it hold? This can really hold up to about 300 people, wow. depending on how you're setting things up. Beautiful. So when they're here, we also have over here the courtyard area. Um, so many of the retreats, they'll kind of come out of their presentations, spend a little time out here. For the school, you'll notice that the kids come out and they play football in the field and soccer and things of that nature. Um, but it's great. One of the beauties of being in Texas is even here in the wintertime, it's beautiful. So we can hang out, spend a little time. We also have our dining facility over here, the atrium. Maybe we'll go take a look at that. Nice. Let's do that. So I'm excited, this is Vesper's Lodge. We'll take a look through Vesper's Lodge. This was the first lodging that we built here at Sanctus Ranch. And so we have 20 hotel style rooms, uh, the ability for 60 people, 60 beds here. Uh, and so usually every weekend, Vesper's Lodge is full of people that are getting a little evening rest before the rest of their time on their retreat. Beautiful. So let's take a look at one of the rooms. Please. We have an upstairs there, same floor plan. What you'll notice is as we go down the hall, each one of the rooms here uh, has a particular saint and their story so that each person gets an opportunity to learn that. Vespers is obviously Latin for evening. We think of evening prayer. And so all of the saints here in Vespers Lodge are priests, deacons, or nuns that would have had the obligation to the liturgy of the hours. So let's enter in one of the rooms. Beautiful. Oh, wow. So as you can see, we built this room. This is two queens in this room. Um, some of the rooms have two queens and two twins. We had a local gentleman make all custom furniture in here, Mitsubishi mini splits. And as I was telling you before, you know, we would go to retreat centers and it always seemed like our Lord was getting the very lowest possible quality. And at Sanctus Ranch, we said, you should get the best. So we've tried to build something that is the best. Yeah, absolutely gorgeous. A, it's phenomenal, it looks phenomenal, uh, but also, like I noticed architecturally, you have like the, the, the corners that aren't sharp, you have the, the, the thick moldings, everything is just drop dead gorgeous. This is just beautiful. How much of this, will, like, this is crazy work. Uh, well, one of the things that I'm very lucky with is my father was in construction. Yeah. And so when we got started on this and we were bringing in investors to help with the project, uh, I was able to design all the buildings that are here and matter of fact, do most of the work. Um, we would bring in framers and other things, um, but we were here day in, day out. My boys got to learn uh, construction and all these projects. So uh, it's been nice because I've been able to hold my thumb to the project and say, no, 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 I want it this way. I want it that way. And uh, so we've gotten the end result that we're looking for. Beautiful. Every facility here, as you'd expect in a high-end hotel, just awesome. Uh, right down to the uh, showers, big, big showers and everything else. So just gorgeous, amazing Absolutely. work. As a big guy, I would always go to retreat centers, and they weren't big enough, so we made sure that they are here. Indeed. So John Henry, we were back at the chapel, and uh, we have adoration every Wednesday here in the chapel, and you happen to be here on a Wednesday, so let's, let's head inside. I'm going to go into some of these other things in the diocese because it's really severe. And I hope most of you know this, so it's just a rerun for you, but I'm going to give you some of the details. So there have been a lot of very good, very holy priests 
cancelled here. Very much like a good holy family's business we know being cancelled right now. I'm going to run over a few of those things because I met them all today and spoke with them here. So we were talking with Dan about um, Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Siller liking to cancel the things that should not be canceled and refusing to cancel things that should indeed be canceled. We've got probably the <laughs> epitome of the example of a cancellation that makes absolutely no sense in uh, Deacon Jean uh, and uh, Jean's wife, Jeannie, who has uh, really experienced the brunt of this kind of cancellation. Uh, Deacon Jean, thank you for joining us. Yes, good to be here. Um, tell us about your story. Why were you canceled and how did that go down? Well, we had a friendship of about 23 years with a couple of people in the parish. Uh, the short of it is that for some reason, this person decided that um, he just decided to get to cozy with Jeannie, but it was, it was touching, inappropriate touching, hugging, bringing her in in a full embrace where there's no people around in his house, uh, coming up behind her, massaging her, and things like that. So I, I sat down and said, we've got to talk about this, please. Uh, the idea wasn't to lose a friendship. The idea was, please, you cannot touch her anymore. You just have to do this. And his answer to me was, women like me touching them. I like touching women, if you, uh, accept me as I am. How did you react when he said that to you, when you said, you know, this is what I'm going to do? I was shocked. 23-year friendship. I said, you've blown up the friendship. Because when you said, I like to touch women, and women like me touching them, he would not have a conversation. All I wanted was, let's talk this through. It's just between, the, between us, and we'll move on. And he wouldn't do it. He basically just flipped me off. And I just said, well, I'm sorry, the friendship's over. That's when he decided to go into the pastor. Hmm. And he went into the pastor, and the pastor called a meeting with Jeannie and myself and said, I want to talk to you about the Dr. So-and-so situation. He, this doctor was a very big giver to the parish. And the pastor, I can't put into words, uh, the meetings we had, how, how he abused us. He shut the door. He sneered at me like this. My wife's sitting there, sneered at me. And he said, and then we have this letter to really bring this down. It says, I expect to her, to both of us, you will be best friends with this guy. And until then, you will fake it until you make it. Jeannie, did you express to the bishop that you were uncomfortable with this touching and it was a problem. I wrote a big long letter to the Archbishop and I never heard a thing. Several times we requested meeting with the Archbishop to discuss this because I became the problem. I was the victim, but they made me the problem and we, the Bishop would not meet with us. Did you consider this sexual harassment? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yes. So this is a, a prime example of how could a bishop not take this seriously? A woman who feels sexually harassed goes to her husband, begs him to take care of the situation. He tries. The perpetrator refuses, goes to the pastor to complain. The pastor uh, then goes, uh, it comes down on you guys, and you told the pastor that you felt this is wrong. And then this goes to the level of the bishop, whom you again tell this is sexual harassment, and yet they blame the two of you. The pastor actually rolled his eyes at me and turned his back to me when I tried to discuss it with him. That's, you know, part of the emotional abuse we went through. He refused to discuss it. We were the problem. He ignored her. And yeah. He, he rolls his eyes. I was in there. Rolls his eyes, turns his back on when he talked to her. So what, what year is this? Uh, 2017. So this is post-2002, sexual harassment, everybody's promising up and down that they will do, like, come hell or high water, they will do everything to rectify these kinds of situations. Correct. Yeah. And nothing was done. I was the problem. So how does this relate then, Jean, to your being cancelled as a deacon? 
Okay, well, there's, okay. So what happened, well, on the website of the archdiocese, uh, there's, when you get into sexual harassment, it said, for example, that you have every right to hire an attorney. We weren't going to hire an attorney. We didn't want money out of the parish. We couldn't get redress. So we hired an attorney. And the head of the diaconate problem program said, because you hired an attorney, I'm not talking to you anymore. Well, it's on the website. There's, they, he's supposed to talk to me. He could, made, could have ameliorated this whole situation. Uh, so that was one piece of this. We hired an attorney. And, uh, and then that led to some other situations. And we get a letter uh, one day from the uh, attorney to the archbishop. Why didn't we have a letter? The attorney the archbishop wrote a letter banning us from the parish. Banning us. You know how many friends we had that died, how many babies I baptized? I couldn't go to those. You say, well, why didn't you show up? He'd call the police. We knew he would call the police on us and rush us out. So we got the banning from that, and then they pulled my faculties. That's, that's the story. Now, it doesn't make sense. There's not a rational basis to this. We came that close, that close to a mental breakdown. Because when you're abused by your pastor, by the church you loved, and they turn on you instead of addressing the situation, but we're strong. And through the Lord, and because the Lord says uh, uh, the gates of hell will not prevail, we hung in there. We did not walk away from the church. And then we've moved on to a different parish, and we, we, we're, we're restored emotionally. It took us years to get, you can't imagine. There's another aspect to the story. I'm going to talk today also with uh, Father Clay Hunt, who was canceled out of this uh, diocese. And I know you worked with him when you were still a deacon. You worked with him in prison ministry. Prison ministry was his uh, already, for after his first banishment, he, he had a parish. He uh, went and spoke with some city officials about homosexuality, the true teachings of the church, uh, asking them to do the right thing. And for that was canceled out of his parish, uh, and then he went into this prison ministry where he was with you, but then he was canceled again. Tell us if you could, just your experiences working with him in the prison ministry, uh, and if you know it, why, why he was canceled from there even. Okay, so we were going through all this, and we went to a new parish, and I got involved in prison ministry. Well, my first meeting was Father Clay, because Father Clay had been taken away from his parish and all that, and he was given prison ministry. In all candor, prison ministry often looks like one of those things, we just put a priest out there because, you know, we don't give him a good parish. Father Clay had this good parish and did all these wonderful things. That's when I went Father Clay. I couldn't believe it. Father Clay, I, I, I have some heroes in my life. Bishop Strickland is one. Father Clay is one. He's a hero priest. Father Clay... He'd come into our meetings. We did the rosary. We prayed. He taught me that Jesus loved those prisoners as much as he loved any of us. He, he, he did mass in the prison. I served several, re I did eight retreats with Father Clay. Those prisoners, look, they're in there. They're coming in there. They were listening to him. He talked 45 minutes or an hour. I'm looking around. They're riveted on him. He was giving him the gospel. They were giving them the gospel. And out of those prison ministries, We'd get 25, 30 people in RCA, and we'd go down and teach RCA. Father Clay, I, I can't put into words, he, he came to my house. Okay, after all this was going on that Jeannie and I were just saying, I, I only took two minutes. He came to my house, did a mass in my home. I had not served as a deacon in the role of a deacon. He said, Gene, I want you to do the gospel. All that. He knows how to heal you. He came two other times. He spent the night. He shows up. He just knows how to heal you. The prisoners loved him. The prisoners were listening to him. He, he, I don't know how to describe it. You almost have to experience it. But, but out of Father Clay's ministry, we came to love the prisoners. And so we'd sit around the table. These guys are un unbelievable things. Murder, rape, you name it. Drugs, drug dealing. They would listen to him. They would respond to him. He would do mass. I'll tell you one thing. He would do mass, but he'd always say, now look, you need to do confession before we do mass, but I'll tell you what, I don't want, how many people need to go to confession? Ten people raise their hands. I better see ten people. He'd go ahead and conduct the mass and get those ten people in. One thing I know is that 
he was told he could do mass in the prison, but he couldn't take confession. That's pure ignorance. <laughs> now, he's either going to commit a, a very serious sin by giving communion to people. They're in prison. Or the prisoner's going to commit a serious sin. Who would... I almost think it has to be stupidity. Who would tell you you can't take confession before you, or after you do Mass? That was just one of the things. It's like he, they, they were slicing him like a thousand small cuts and watching just this man. I can't put into words the love and respect I have for Father Clay. And um, we had some rallies down there in the Archdiocese. Here's how fear works. I know people of Father Clay, they're afraid to go stand down where the rallies are because people in that archdiocese have seen them maybe turn them in. Maybe you've got a choir director, a grand knight. They're afraid to go. We weren't afraid to go. I'm proud to stand of Father Clay. I put up publicly on his Facebook things. I love Father Clay. This man, this person, to feel we've lost this man doing this wonderful ministry and as you know this all these cancel priests they're st they're nightmare stories i've been following this cancel priest website but you know father clay never never takes this out into the public with how he was treated he doesn't do that he just lives with it so yes i was with him i knew him intimately um uh, he's a hero priest of mine and i'm just hoping that someday the, that he will be able to come back like Bishop Strickland or some of these other guys that were just, oh my gosh, those stories are, how do you even describe it? You know, how would you describe he's it? A, it's just, he's a holy, holy man. He is. Father Clay's holy. And it's a, a loss to our church, a huge loss. Yeah. Gene and Jeannie, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us your story. God bless you. Thank you. One of those priests is one who gave the opening prayer. Father Clay Hunt the cowboy priest, as he's known on YouTube. is very much a very simple, very holy Catholic priest whose love for Christ so emanates, so shines forth from him that nobody can deny it. Any enemy of Father Hunt would be hard-pressed to say, no, that guy doesn't love Jesus. You just can't say that. So what's the cancellation all about? Where did that even come from? Well, I know what it comes from. Well, the first cancellation came from speaking the truth of the church in what Pope Benedict called a very dangerous thing. He, Pope Benedict said that soon it will become impossible to state the teachings of the church in this area of homosexuality. Because in many countries, like my own in Canada, we have hate crime laws. You might end up in jail for saying such things. But you know, it's funny. The teaching of the church is all about love. There is nothing but love in the teaching of the church on this hardest issue, even though every time you open your mouth about the teaching of the church on it, you're called a hater and a bigot. It's amazing, but the response needs to be, I love you enough to tell you that this behavior hurts you. It hurts your body, it hurts your mind, and even worse than that, it hurts your soul. And I want to see you in heaven forever with Jesus Christ. So I love you enough to tell you this, even though you're going to call me a hater and bigot, even though it might land me in jail. So Father Hunt, who's willing to sacrifice himself, as few priests are, well, I shouldn't say that. There are lots of priests who are, but unfortunately, I'd say the majority aren't. Got canceled for speaking the truth. That was cancellation number one. And you know, when a good priest gets canceled, thrown out of his parish, his parishioners grieve. They do, just like the Diocese of Tyler next door, virtually next door to here, is grieving for the loss of their shepherd, the bishop. Bishop Strickland is just incredible. And yet his diocese was ripped of him, of their father. And a parish feels very much like that too, when a parish gets ripped of its holy priest. There are many tears shed by many parents 
who knew that their children would now no longer be formed so well by their own beloved parish priest. But Father Hunt went on to do prison ministry. And boy, what a ministry that was. Incredible stories I heard uh, from Deacon Jean, who worked with him in the prison ministry, of hardened criminals, murderers, rapists, coming to sit and listen to Father Hunt for 45 minutes or more. It's incredible because the Lord blesses. The Lord blesses his servants. But woe to those who harm his servants. But lots of those prisoners joined RCIA. Lots of those prisoners became Catholics, instructed in the faith by Father Hunt. Sadly, Father Hunt has been removed from that ministry as well. But the prisoners have very little voice to be able to issue their complaints to the archdiocese. However, the YouTube channel seems to be going very well. <laughs> so I think Father Hunt is very much yet being used by our Lord. And he will be, because in that man and so many other good men in this diocese who've been canceled, is the same fire that will burn unto death. And should we come to the times when we're called not only to this white martyrdom, but to red, it's men like our cowboy priest who will be ready to sacrifice all for his Lord. So one of the pieces of this puzzle is the cancellation of uh, good and holy priests by uh, Archbishop Garcia Siller. And uh, one of those priests is uh, known on YouTube anyway as the cowboy priest. His name is Father Clay Hunt. Welcome, Father Hunt. Thank you, sir. I want to tell you, Mr. John Henry Weston, that we appreciate the work that you do for the Lord and for Holy Mother Church. And I want to say hello to all your viewers, tell you how much we love you and give you encouragement, even in the midst of the hardship of these days and unbelievable happenings, that you stay faithful to God and that you make it your business to adhere to the life of Holy Mother Church, the sacramental life of Holy Mother Church, no matter what. Amen to that. So, Father, tell us, you are a, a priest. Anyone who goes to your YouTube channel or you're on Instagram, uh, Father Clay Hunt, um, they know you are a priest who loves Our Lady, who loves Our Lord, who's all about preaching about Jesus and living the life of the faith. Why were you canceled? I'll tell you briefly, I just uh, celebrated 15 years of ordination to the Holy Priesthood that was on January the 10th of this year, so we say it was our quinceanero, as we'd say in Spanish, and I love being a priest. And we recognize that the priesthood is most essentially, uh, it's the oneness uh, with our Lord Jesus Christ, the priest, the high priest, the only priest, and in the mystery of it, it's, it's the passion. Uh, so... We're not uh, disillusioned by these bad happenings, even though uh, it's, it's true that they are somewhat unbelievable how things have come to be. And I would like to say, uh, uh, as regards to my individual person, I don't want to get into a he said, she said, no pun intended, but... There are many injustices that are taking place in the world today, in the, in the church. And that's why I believe the most critical thing is for you, the people of God, to be able to, as a whole, reach a threshold of understanding that, as in my opinion, St. Archbishop Fulton Sheen would say uh, that you may 
rise up people of God to put the house of God in order. That's what I pray for daily and desire because I don't believe there is any other way uh, for the vindication of the church in the natural order but through the laity. And I will tell you, uh, I mean, you can, you can uh, research my own particular life through things on the media, but I will tell you, even for my poverty as a man, I have done nothing absolutely against God or against God's people or an offense to Holy Mother Church that would merit or uh, that would warrant, you know, a cancellation. And uh, even though I accept it for the injustice of these days, uh, you know, like they sang to me on the day that I was ordained 15 years ago, you are a priest forever in the line of Melchizedek. And I have every intention, even if I have to be a priest in exile, I've told the Lord many times, I will never go out of my vows to the holy priesthood. That's beautiful. You know, a lot of other priests canceled, but even in this diocese, there are uh, deacons canceled, other priests canceled. Have you seen, I mean, among those deacons, let's say, who we're going to speak to in a little bit, was there something wrong? What, what was their great crime? That's a good question, sir. And here's the great crime, because people need to come to understand this. In the midst of these things, sometimes people in good faith will ask me, uh, Father, how are these things possible? Or how could men who are supposed to be holy to God do such things? And I remind them that this is absolutely not unprecedented in the history of, of the people of God. And we go back to the covenant of Moses and the religious leaders, authentic religious leaders to God's people in the covenant to Moses were the high priests, the Pharisees. And I remind people that there was a great tradition of holy Pharisees, you know, men who, as we say and as we recognize, even for our natural poverty, the grace of God is sufficient that even, in fact, men can be holy. And there were holy men. Even in the time of our Lord, although they were few in number, there were a handful of them. We remember those accounted to in the sacred scriptures like Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus or Saul of Tarsus. They were holy men. Uh, but the majority of them and the vast majority of them were seduced and freely given themselves into greed, lust, power, envy. And that is precisely what drove them to be in the first degree responsible for the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they were the ones, you know, I, I never, I, I knew it, but I never deeply understood it that Throughout the entire scripture, even in these days, uh, throughout the entire gospel, even in these days of recent, how many times were the, the Pharisees explicitly against our Lord Jesus Christ? How many times was he trying to hide from them in order, not because he was afraid, absolutely, but because he knew their wicked intention? And that's... That's the number one problem that we're dealing with in our time. I like to call them the modern day Pharisees. And although they are authentically in that place, it's the same spirit that possessed to those men in the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And it is far more insidious in our time because it's not isolated to the Holy Land. It's worldwide. And it's surpassing in insidiousness to the times of old. That's why I call these guys of the modern era the, the Pharisees on steroids. And, and their bad behaviors can neither be understood logically because it's illogical. It doesn't make sense to a person who has faith to God and who thinks in in logical manner. Evil is unintelligible. It has no, no authenticity of reason. It's irrational and wicked. But that's exactly what where we find ourselves. And these, uh, you know, tremendous cancellations will not be able to be understood uh, in a rational or logical manner because in its essence, it's of wickedness. To, to put some flesh on those bones, I know that in this diocese, there's all sorts of, even priests, who are doing things that would merit cancellations, uh, some involved even in, in homosexual, sexual uh, things that have been public, some who have, um, you know, there have been Catholic uh, education centers who have taught LGBT propaganda against the church's teachings. There are pro-abortion conferences with, with nuns present. There are um, even, um, there's, there's, even during COVID, there was an absolute prohibition on receiving Holy Communion on the tongue, which is the right of the faithful. Um, there were, uh, you know, these ACT conferences, Catholic conferences that uh, had, you know, uh, testimonies with LGBT people and things like that. In, in, a, in a way, a contrary to the church's teaching. None of those were canceled. None of those priests are canceled. In fact, one of those priests is brought into the diocese from another diocese where he was canceled. And yet, yourself, other good and holy priests are canceled and good and holy deacons are canceled for the reasons of doing what you should be doing as priests and deacons. Uh, that's true, sir. And there are... One of the one of the insidious roots to to what would make possible for men to think in such a way in this problem absolutely I, I can tell you that <clears throat> I truly love uh, Archbishop Gustavo and we worked together for for years uh, you know I was serving in the far west of the Archdiocese of San Antonio that's called the Uvalde Rule Deanery. And I served as dean there for six plus years. So I had to work very closely uh, with Archbishop Gustavo. And when he came out of Chicago, yes, that was in 2011, uh, you know, he's a charismatic person. And and uh, we we were rocking and rolling, if you, if you want to say like that. And and I was happy to serve with him, and uh, but unfortunately, to you know, to things and th this, you know, in in human uh, nature, human disposition. I mean, you can have uh, certain poverties that that uh, I mean, that's just like a natural thing, dislikes and things like that, but. What we're talking with, and this isn't isolated to just one particular region or one particular area. People need to understand this. This is a tremendous systemic problem in the church, widespread. And as you mentioned briefly, or as you alluded to, I believe that one of the, the most insidious root causes of these things, or what is a common thread is is homosexuality, you know, in the priesthood, in the hierarchy, and even all the way to high seats, high positions. And what's how does the old saying go? There's uh, hell hath no scorn. No fury like a woman scorned. Yeah, hell hath no fury 
like a woman scorned. And that's, uh, you know, there can be truth in that statement. But there is something even surpassing to that. Hell has no fury like the, the scorn of a homosexual man. <laughs> and, and that's why, I mean, when, when persons, first of all, there is absolutely no room in the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ for a man of that disposition. Why? Why is that? Because it's so powerful. And especially if a, a man has given himself into that sin, it's, 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 so, uh, it's so powerful that it's surpassing to any other temptation. And uh, the devil, the enemy himself, is able to, to use those things. And obviously... There's no more important, uh, you know, spiritual position than for a man to be in the priesthood. And, and therefore, he, a man of that disposition, and especially one who has given himself into those things, it is, it is impossible for him. It, it's directly in opposition to the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so even if a man has certain good intentions, uh, he can't handle the spirituality of the priesthood and the responsibility of the priesthood uh, in that way. And all the, the scandals, especially the sexual scandals that have taken place in the church, it finds its origin in uh, homosexuality. One of the things, and, and probably we'll end here, one of the things that um, it certainly seems with the Sanctus Ranch cancellation, th there seems to be a tie-in to the Latin Mass. It was, you know, canceled uh, in certain other parts of the diocese here by Archbishop Gustavo um, in, in, in the Ordinariate Parish, for instance, and in other places. And... Here, that seemed to be a focus. This is one of these refuges, if you will, that, that people who wanted the Latin Mass could come and receive it, the Latin Mass in this area of Texas. That seems to have been a focus, perhaps, of, of the cancellation. Any, any thoughts that way? One thing that's important to, to realize, especially to, to the lay faithful, I was born in 1972, so that was just shortly after... Uh, the suspension of the traditional Latin Mass. And, you know, in, in its essence, that was an insidious move because we recognize that through the, the guidance and the intention of the Lord himself, that's the Holy Spirit, the church through the centuries came to, to that crescendo or perfection, if you will, of worship to God which we know is the traditional Latin Mass. And that's, that's if you want to say, the full power. So just look at, we were talking about it yesterday. You look in the, the 1950s, late 1950s, uh, mass attendance among Catholics was higher than 80%. Uh, that's amazing. And just a brief few decades after the cancellation, if you will, of the traditional Latin Mass, the Novus Ordo, in which I grew up in, it's not the bad intentions of persons, but it's the neglect of the things to God that result in, in our, to, to our tremendous detriment that now only the statistic is 8% of Catholics go to the Sunday Mass weekly. I mean, that's, that's indicative that there's a tremendous problem. And so these movements, which is, again, systemic in the universal church to cancel the traditional Latin Mass in its origin is demonic. And, 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 and that manifests itself in however it plays out throughout the world but the the one who truly desires 
And the only reason is because, in fact, it is the fullness of worship and holiness to God. The one who desires the cancellation of the traditional Latin Mass is the enemy himself. And then either in full cooperation or unknowing cooperation, it's being played out all over the world. What keeps you going, Father, despite being canceled? I believe in God. Amen. Father Clay Hunt, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Father Donald Kloster is uh, the only priest right now who actually lives at Sanctus Ranch and offers the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass here. There's another priest who comes in as well, Father Wagner. Um, but we wanted to talk to Father Kloster about uh, life here. But first of all, we'll start talking about uh, you're a canceled priest. Uh, what were you canceled for? I was canceled mainly because I wouldn't offer the uh, the Mass in, in English. And... I had been saying the traditional Latin Mass in the Diocese of Bridgeport for over two years with the bishop's knowledge and, and presumed, uh, his, his presumed uh, willingness to let me do it. And then all of a sudden things changed. I don't know if it was Rome, if it was Pierre, if it was, if it was the Pope himself, but it, it became very clear that they were singling me out because I was the only one other than a retired priest who said the traditional Mass alone. And... So I lost my faculties on March 7th uh, of last year. And Father, if I might ask, it, was it a matter of conscience for you? What, what led you to that, that, uh, that way of being? Well, so I've said the Mass for 25 years. And over the years, I've been assigned to several parishes, five parishes, in fact, that offered both. And it became clear to me that I was getting no vocations from the from the Novus Ordo. In fact, it was 28 to 1. The one Novus Ordo vocation I did get, who was a spiritual directee of mine, he became a priest and then left the priesthood here about five years ago. So now it's 21 to nothing because seven of the traditional Latin Mass individuals left their, their discernment process. So 21 are either in final vows, priests, or somewhere in the discerning journey. And I, I can't get over that, 21 to nothing. And all these parishes had substantially more people going to the Novus Ordo, and yet I couldn't get any vocations. And it, it just made me scratch my head. And I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired of literally, in a, in a figurative sense, beating my head against the wall and getting no results. I know the traditional Mass is fruitful. Why would I offer a Mass that gets me no results? So one of the th interesting things about this Sanctus Ranch, it's a family-owned business. They are here, and they're, they're obviously for them this is a Catholic apostolate because they're meaning to bring people to our Lord Jesus Christ. They have a beautiful facility here, um, and they have for the people who come and obviously for their family as well um, a, a traditional mass that you offer and, and other priests have come to offer um, somehow behind the cancellation of the whole ranch it seems to me anyway that the Latin mass has something to do with it what would you say absolutely and it wasn't in the letter but it, it definitely I think is at the crux and the heart of why they're trying to persecute Sanctus Ranch. It's also a matter of money. It's a matter of families coming here. I was told through a third party that I'm not the type of priest that they want representing San Antonio. They wouldn't really give a reason or, or what that meant. But that, that's curious to me. What have I done? Present the evidence to make me someone who would not represent the diocese well or the archdiocese well. I think that's a red herring and I think it really gets to the heart of the issue, it's political. It has nothing to do with theology. And if it does have something to do with theology, then they need to state what that is, because heresy is very definable. So you are not stripped of your faculties. In other words, you can still offer the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And explain to us, this is a private ranch, so it's not a public Mass. So what's the problem? So I'm very familiar with these things. Uh, this is the sixth time I've lost my faculties in one way or another. Sometimes it was just 
I was restricted at one point to just San Antonio, and I couldn't hear confessions anywhere else. Confession is a different matter. You cannot hear confessions if the, the, the faculty has been withdrawn. And I did. I, I wrote to Archbishop Gustavo back in, back in late March of, of last year, and he denied me faculties here. I know he could have given me faculties had he wanted to. He chose not to. And so I have not heard a confession in, in 11 months. There's been accusations, but they're, 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 they're non-founded, and you could really ask anyone here. I've had several people come up to me and ask me to hear their confession, and I always say, we have, there's other places you can go to confession. I, I can't hear your confession. The other side of that is saying mass. So a priest at his domicile has a right to say mass. Now, the ecclesial authorities call it a private mass. There's no such thing in canon law. It's a mass. All masses are by their very nature public. And if a priest says a mass that he has a right to say every day and people come to that mass, they have a right to come. Mm -hmm. This is private property. I'm not saying mass in a church at a published time. I have, had, I have said mass in the sacristy at a non-published time in a parish in these 11 months. But no one came. It was just me and the sacristy. So, again... This is totally legitimate. We've, we've cleared it with canon lawyers. We, we know what we're talking about. And if people want to criticize from the outside, present us the evidence because this, this ranch and, and this apostolate, they're popping up all over the country. Cancel priests are being joined with faithful who want the old mass. And it's a grassroots, grassroots movement. He's been described by some people as the beginnings of an underground church because the Latin Mass, which for some people means a great deal, has been taken away from them. Pope Benedict told us, uh, reaffirming church teaching, that it was ne it should never have been abrogated. They had no right to, and he, he didn't so much as allow for it again as to recognize its allowance that priests are able to say it despite their bishop's contrary wish because it is the Mass of our Fathers, which we can never uh, do away with. Um, tell us about your thoughts about the underground church and how this sort of situation may relate to it. I could be wrong, but from my perspective and talking to priests all over the country, this, this isn't going away. These bishops, I don't think they really realize that they're fighting against, against God. The, the demons hate Latin. They, they fear it, and in exorcism after exorcism, we, we find this to be the truth. This Latin Mass is incredibly fruitful. It's the only one that the, the society isn't smashing. The society is smashing the Novus Ordo. Uh, it's not allowing for growth in the, in the Anglican use. Uh, you, you stick a Muslim family in the suburbs, and all their kids will leave the faith. <laughs> you stick a, a Mormon uh, family in, in, the, in the suburbs away from their Mormon enclave. Almost all their kids will leave the faith. We have seen a rise in atheism and a rise in, in agnosticism like never before. The only thing that seems to me to be a protective bubble is the Latin Mass. And you stick your kid, you stick your kid in the Latin Mass from the age of seven, by the time they leave home at 18, 97% of them are going to practice. Now that's phenomenal. And it's at the opposite pole from what's going to happen to Novus Ordo kids. They'll go at about a 5% clip in 11 years. So um, I tell this to, to, to parents, and sometimes it just goes right over their head. You see the glaze go over their eyes. They don't want to hear it. And I'm thinking, if I were a dad and I heard that stat, because I was, you know, at the age of, until the age of 32, I was not a traddy. I was not traditional. I, I don't, I, if I'd ever heard that stat and I was a dad, my kids would be in the Latin Mass the next day. So we have, this situation is, is, is rather unique because the bishop has come after a private institution, a family, family with six kids. This is their livelihood. Um, and so I'd just love to hear your comments on that because that, that's what, to me, was so striking about this. This is a family-owned business. This is a family with six kids who have poured their hearts and souls and, and, and really sacrificed to build this up, yes, for their family business, but also for the glory of the church. They're, they're good and holy Catholics from everything I can see. 
Yes, and it was it was shocking the way in which he he slandered Mr. Seventy, the owner of this property, as well as myself and Father Fashing, uh, citing things that were totally not true. And I'm thinking, well, you know, your spies were really bad because they didn't get things right. And he he said some libelous things in there. I was always told as a young priest, you sue a bishop, you sue a sitting bishop, and you'll be blacklisted. So I I never even thought of it before. Now they've pushed me too far, and I'm going to find a lawyer, and I'm I'm going to do whatever I can to clear my good name. Yeah, you were accused in there of um, having of hearing confessions, uh, which you haven't done since you're you're being refused the faculties for that. Uh, yet they say you did do it in the in the letter, which is quite quite something by itself. Uh, but then in addition to that. They give the implication that your masses might not be valid. Just tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, anybody who went to Ecclesiology 101 would know the difference between validity and, and laicity. There's no question. I was, I was ordained in St. Augustine's Cathedral in Bridgeport by the eventual Car- Cardinal Egan in 1995. Anybody can find that out. I'm a validly ordained priest. Then, then when you when you get into the, the the little subtleties, the other implication which shocked me, it implied that somehow that Father Fashing and myself were either mentally unstable or were abusing children. Now that implication that is so libelous. I would never I would never say anything remotely like that publicly to anyone. That's that's beyond charity. It's beyond the truth. It's beyond what we should represent as priests and bishops. So what is your thoughts about the ranch, its continuation despite the, the I mean, because this, that from a secular standpoint, that's killer to a business. He basically told all your potential customers, all the, the customers that are uh, involved with the church, so the businesses that would uh, come in and use these facilities, these specifically Catholic facilities, uh, which was used by the Archbishop himself before and all sorts of church groups. But he basically told them they're prohibited, in other words, totally forbidden, and told the faithful, don't even come here for any events, nothing. Yes, and I, I, it, we did get some cancellations, uh, which, which I know uh, really caused a lot of grief with the, with the 70 family. But I know from a from a spiritual standpoint that we'll we'll get other income sources that that we don't, aren't even considering now. We know that we have had Protestants groups coming here, and in the letter was nothing about uh, Protestant ministers celebrating services here. Um, it, it, it's funny that they call us schismatics, but they would never use that word for one of the separated brethren. They would never call, let's say, a Lutheran a schismatic. Um, very interesting how how they they manipulate words and they man, man, manipulate the story to their end, which which of course you would you would expect somebody from their perspective to give to give their side but you don't expect them to go overboard and go into some libelous territory the other thing that, that has really struck me is that spiritually speaking our mass is growing the school is growing and like i said i think the retreats will grow Final thoughts for us, Father Kloster. Yeah, I, I guess I would just really like to emphasize that the Latin Mass is not going away. And as you look at it from a spiritual standpoint, they're, sm- they're trying to smash every diocesan Mass currently operating. They're leaving for the moment the religious orders alone. Those religious orders have the best growth. And I, I know it's because they offer all the sacraments. And so they're trying to pigeonhole the the diocesan traditional Latin masses into just a mass. No confirmations, no first communions, no baptisms, just if you, if you have permission, it's for the mass. A family is not gonna be attracted to that. And, and so some families are even deciding to move near the Institute of Christ the King, Fraternity of St. Peter, Church of the Good Shepherd. And I think going forward, there's such growth in those communities, around 20% a year that that is going to be what eventually saves us. And as, I, as I've always said, uh, things came in through the back door with Vatican II. And, and we, we have to realize that the, the, the Latin Mass as it was, 
was a lot of low masses, very few high masses, almost no solemn high masses. Now this younger generation, these, these younger priests, they want sung masses. They want to, to have the solemn high mass. Uh, they, they say the mass slower. The, the sermons seem to be better, better prepared. And so I think because of the, the, what happened at Vatican II, we're getting, we went from 80% in 1958, and now we're getting 97%. So maybe that was the reform that the Holy Ghost always wanted and that we didn't really see. We just saw everything that was happening with Vatican II and with the changes of the Mass. We didn't see what was going to come in 2007 from the back door. Amazing. Father Cluster, so good to be with you. God too. bless you. Too. Father David Wagner is one of the uh, teachers here at Lumen Christi Academy as part of Sanctus Ranch. Uh, Father, thank you for joining us. It's great to uh, be with you. Thank you for coming all the way down here to talk with us. So um, tell us something about what's going on here. I mean, this is very confusing. This is a Catholic family from all that we know of them, and you can see of them in their life. It's a holy Catholic family. I mean, you probably shouldn't tell them that to their faces, but, you know, they are striving to live for the faith, and they have a great little family business, so their family can keep going. Six children, and and uh, but they poured their heart and soul into this beautiful place. Yes. The shutdowns, it's, it's, I don't even know what's happening. It's unreal. Uh, it is difficult to understand. Um, the, as you said, these, uh, these, these people are hardworking, faithful people devoted to uh, the mission of this place, which is the Christian formation, the Catholic formation of uh, students. And uh, as you probably know and have heard, we have a, a classical a curriculum here. Um, we're not teaching the kinds of things that you get in public school or even other Catholic schools. Um, they are learning uh, the classics. They they uh, learn Latin. We teach history from the perspective of the Catholic Church. I teach English and and history. They also are uh, are studying uh, mathematics, algebra. But as you said, the the uh, the seventy family, they are they are devoted. And I, from my perspective. They are responding to the call of, of the Lord to do all this. Um, and I, I, I think that uh, they're, do, they're doing very well. And um, we've more than doubled since we started. We started last September with six students. We're, we have 15 now. And more keep coming around, uh, you know, uh, shadowing. The, the parents bring their children to shadow. And they come to uh, the school to, to see what's happening here, and I think we'll have we'll probably have forty come September this September. So what's going on here? I mean, you're a priest in the Archdiocese of San Antonio. Um, do you understand any of this? What have you seen of this uh, in your own in your own priesthood? Uh, well, uh, again, I don't understand uh, what the, the leadership of this archdiocese has in mind. Uh, again, this is a holy place. Uh, why you would want to uh, restrict or curtail it or shut it down, I can't imagine. Um, it would be good if, if we all just, you know, to quote Rodney Hill, if we just all got along. Um, but in my experience, um, I was, uh, I'm a convert. I, so I was in the ordinary to the chair of St. Peter. Mm. And then uh, the archdiocese invited me. I didn't approach them. They approached me and asked me if I would want to come into the archdiocese and take a parish, which I did for six years. And then, um, for lack of a better term, I was forcibly retired. Uh, on, on what grounds, if you don't mind me asking, Father? Well, others have told me it was it was political. It was uh, because of my uh, orthodox and conservative views, my being a traditionalist. It was for the, for those reasons. Hmm. My first year of retirement, um, I did okay because I had a lot of calls to 
to do uh, masses at parishes for priests who are on vacation and so forth, then that all kind of dried up. And uh, like at that precise time, Dan called me up and said, I'm starting a school. Would you be interested in, in coming? And I said, absolutely. So at first, he wanted me to just come uh, say mass daily and, and hear confessions. Then he said, would you like to teach full time? And I said, sure, of course. Now, recently you heard from uh, the Archbishop uh, regarding your work at the school. What was that? Uh, he demanded that I resign immediately. Uh, and I told him, I won't. Uh, I said, I'll resign from Lumen Christi Academy, just not now. Maybe, you know, years from now I'll eventually resign. Um, the response I got through the Vicar of Clergy was, uh, he said, you can finish out your contract uh, to the end of May of this year, and then after that you were expecting you to submit a letter of resignation. So you are uh, a priest in the ordinariate, so you came in from the Anglican, right? You were a married man. Do you have children? I do. I have two children. One is a, co a recent college graduate. The other one is a, a senior in high school who will graduate uh, in May. So when the diocese took you away from your parish that you were running for years, did they provide for you a salary? No, they did not. I got no salary. I got no retirement. Uh, I got literally nothing from them. So now you have a job here at the Lumen Christi Academy, uh, and uh, they're telling you you must resign. Did they tell you when you resign you're going to be getting a salary from them or a parish back or anything? No. They suggested I contact the, uh, the, um, uh, the superintendent of Catholic schools to discuss a, a job. But um, I, I haven't done that, and I have no intention of doing that. I have every intention of staying here. Jennifer Seveny is the mother of this great family, this great Sanctus Ranch, and uh, Dan's beloved wife, Jennifer, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for being here. Jennifer, I wanted to ask you specifically what the impact has been for your family of what's gone down with the Archbishop. Um, Tell us how that's going for you and for your family. Well, you know, it's um, it took us a little bit by surprise. Um, we have been, you know, faithfully working for seven and a half years to build up this um, retreat center. It's our home, and we have a mission here to just bring people to Christ, to open our home in a way that... Um, People can come here and they can get away from the craziness of the world and unplug. And all of that has just come to a very abrupt stop. Um, we're all in here at the ranch. Um, seven and a half years ago, we bought the property. Um, and through a lot of blood, sweat and tears and um, sweat equity, we have put everything in here. Um, our kids do not have a, a college fund. We don't have a retirement fund. We're just all in. Um, and this is the second time that we've kind of been impacted by something that the diocese, the church has done. Um, in 2020, when the world shut down, uh, we were booked 46 weekends out of the year uh, for retreats, and that stopped abruptly. And we really wondered whether we could get through this. And through Dan's creativity, we are still here. Um, and then to have it all taken away again, we've had contracts with people, um, and they've broken their contracts with us. So the income has literally just stopped um, because people don't even feel like they can come to our own events that we host. Um, they've been prohibited. They feel like they just can't even you know, come here at all. So this is the church you love. This is the very thing that you are working for and toward. Um, what is that? How do you feel that's going to impact your kids? My, my prayer, my hope for my children is that even despite all of these things that are happening, um, that they will not lose their faith, um, that they will stay strong in their faith. And I feel like where our family is now, they will. 
Um, something very miraculous has happened to our family over the last year. Um, and just being a part of the Latin Mass and having that experience, I think, has brought our children to a greater um, understanding and level of their faith. And as a mom, all you want is for your children to remain in the faith and know that that is the ultimate um, goal and to, to get them to heaven. And I think in many ways, our children have taken us on this journey. And we didn't know much about the Latin Mass or anything like that. And I just feel like now we are part of that ultimate pinnacle of our faith. This was a pretty direct attack from the Archbishop, from he who is to be your spiritual leader, your spiritual father in, in the diocese. Uh, you've been in this diocese for years now. It, the church here has worked with you before. What did that feel and what's your feeling or sense towards him right now? Some people think, oh, look at the 70s do this for their own, you know, to say, look at us. And that's not what it's all about. It's about bringing people to Christ. And we just feel so convicted. And if the Lord wants to if he wants this he will equip us to be able to fulfill this mission and if it's not meant to be then you know it won't happen you know it's 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 hard to follow the will of God um and to know, is this his will? Is it not his will? And, um, yeah, we just, we just want to be here for people. We just want to have our home opened to them. And so it's, it just, it's hard when people judge. Because people that have known us for, you know, years, right? We've been in Texas since 2012. Like, they just, they don't even feel like they can, they haven't even reached out, right? Because they're just, I don't know if they're afraid to or what, but, um, you know, sometimes you feel like you're on a little island. I mean, we have amazing friends now, new people um, supporting us, but, you know, you're constantly asking yourself, I know Dan is all the time, like, is this... You know, is this the will of God? And if it is, then we'll fight like hell to keep it. And if it's not, then God will just shut that door and we'll be okay because he's a strong man and he'll figure it out. But you've just worked so hard to build something beautiful people can experience and for someone to just want to just take that away because they're so... I feel like he's insecure. And, uh, that's, I don't know. That's how I feel. Um, God bless you. Thank you. We are praying for you. We will continue to, and thank I'm sure you. lots of people will be, uh, when they learn about it, part of the problem is they haven't learned yet. Yeah. 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 Well, we're grateful. We're grateful that you're here to tell our story. Really, yeah. Amen. We're very proud to do that. Thank you. <laughs> Matthias Seveny is the fifth in the family, and uh, I hear he's responsible for uh, introducing the family to the Latin Mass. Matthias, thanks for joining us. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad to be here. So, Matthias, um, you seem to be one who has brought the family to Latin Mass. How did that happen? What's that about? Well, I've been going to Nova Sordo my entire life, and I really just wanted more reverence, and I discovered that there was a liturgy that was very beautiful that we had everywhere in the Catholic world before the Vatican Council, and I even discovered what that was, and I just wanted to go, and luckily it took some time, but my family came along with me, and now we all go. <laughs> so, um, 
this is one thing about the Latin Mass. It, it, it's attractive to so many young people. Um, how old are you right now? 17. Okay. So what was it? That you mentioned reverence, but there's a lot of young people. What do you think is there for young people? That it, you know, I think many people think, oh, this is an old thing for old people, but it seems not to be. Um, I think when you try to not so much sell a liturgy to somebody, but rather you let that liturgy draw them into it, whereas a lot of times you see with the new liturgy, they try to s specifically focus on the young people. They'll have a life teen mass or something like that, and it just it doesn't feel authentic. It feels like they're trying to sell you something, um, but the liturgy isn't like that. It's supposed to attract us and bring us in, and I feel that's what the traditional liturgy does for young people. It feels authentic. If I can ask you about this current situation, what do you make of this? The, you know, what it has, is it going to rock your faith? Where are you at? I personally feel fine in my faith, even with everything that has happened. Um, it's still sad. Um, I care for the church very deeply. My family has always loved the church, and we've always tried to do what we can for the church. Um, but we'll, we'll stick on the boat even there, though there are rocky waves. Absolutely beautiful. Matthias, thank you. God bless you. Thank you. I reached out to the Archbishop's office, asking them for clarification. The communications director sent me back an email with the same press release I already had, telling me there's going to be no further comment. We're outside the Archdiocese of San Antonio main offices. We are here to witness and partake in this prayer demonstration happening outside the Archdiocesan office because the Archdiocese has chosen to attack a Catholic family, a Catholic family business. The Savigny family, as you all know, six children are all in into Sanctus Ranch. All their savings, everything they are, they felt called by the Lord to make this incredible Catholic business which offers to everyone the beauty of retreats and a place to have the Holy Sacrifice, the Mass, to have spiritual direction, to have all this from priests who are thrown out, who are cancelled, who have nothing else to do. They provide such a beautiful space for the most faithful and they're doing it as an act of real love and true devotion and it is so much work. But their blood, sweat and tears have been spit upon, cast out by the Archdiocese. Just as many priests have been cancelled, this is the first time we've seen the cancellation of a Catholic family, their own private business, a business which strove to do the work of Christ. So we're here, we're going to be praying together the, uh, the um, Divine Mercy Prayer. We're going to be praying, and this is being taped, by the way, on the feast of the Chair of St. Peter. So we're going to be praying for the conversion of the Archbishop, we're going to be praying the Holy Rosary. We're going to be singing Faith of Our Fathers. It's something that is beyond what we've seen so far. This is a new step in the, you might say, underground church. We knew persecution was coming. We felt that persecution earlier, the last couple of years, from the FBI, from the government itself, going to the homes of Catholic men and women threatening their children with firearms in their faces, taking away fathers in front of their children in shackles for nothing but being outside of abortion clinics and wit witnessing to the faith with great charity. That same persecution, though, we see happening now from the church from what should be our fathers in the faith who are canceling the holiest of priests, who are canceling those who refuse to be silent about the truths of Christ, and who are crushing the mass of our ancestors. This is impossible. Even, even those of us who don't frequent the Latin Mass but still have a love for it because it is the very mass of all of our ancestors in the faith who lived and died for this mass. We know from the teachings of Pope Benedict and before him every pope that this mass is our patrimony, one which can't be removed from us. And part of this crushing is that issue itself. 
But there's a new point here in the cancellation of a family of a private business, which is the livelihood for a father and a mother and their six beautiful children. So in a special way, it's for the Savigny family that we pray. It's for the Savigny family that they are right now, in a way, white martyrs for the cause of family in the church and for the great scandal of the corruption in the church that's led us to this point. By all rights, this deserves to be an international story. Let's pray together today, too, that the mainstream media picks it up so that Catholics around the world are able to see what's happening. It is the voice of the faithful that's called to act right now. We're called to spread this travesty, but in the midst of the travesty is great hope. We believe that wherever sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. We believe that our Lord's promise that you will be given nothing that you won't be able to bear with his grace. And if anybody has the grace of the Lord, it's the Savinias. The agony in the garden. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy 